we're starting a new series. And it's pretty exciting. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I have to say, a uh, long time ago, I had a pastor in another church give a talk on relationships. And it had impacted me. And I've held on to a lot of those teachings. And at the time, it was about marriage and another one on parenting. Both at the time, I was n neither married or a parent. So, uh, <laughs> but the, the teaching was just, it, held, it just stood out to me. And I held on to it. And I used those principles today. And we have, uh, we have a wonderful couple coming up to share with us. Nathan and Emily Sanders are going to share with us, and they're going to just walk us through some of the things in relationships so we get to learn from them today. Let's welcome them. Hey, good morning, everybody. It's good to see you. Good to be back with you. Let's see if I can set all this down without crashing. Good morning. Really great to be back after some weeks away, some that were planned and some that were unplanned, and much longer than I was planning, uh, and really thankful to be back here, and it just, I just felt, it bothered my heart to be gone, and uh, and I really am just excited for this sharing in ministry together, not just this morning, but to be a part of the Henrietta Congregation of Elam Gospel Church. And you know, one of the good questions is, why are we here, and why, why am I here? And I've, I've answered that question quite a while ago, but one of the things that I really sense in my heart as I began to experience God's call and sense the Lord leading us here, and I've just been reflecting on it, being away from you for a number of weeks, we're here, God's called this campus to reach the South Rochester towns and boroughs in the South Rochester area, and you'll be hearing more in the future about that, and we're here, God, God has a special call for this congregation to reach this South Rochester area, the universities, the young adults, the professionals, and the families living in this area, there's so many families and so many needs and to be here as a people who are growing God's kingdom and advancing the kingdom of God and seeing people touched and changed by the Lord. And that is why we were here. That's why we're here. And th this is just burning inside of me. And we do that one day at a time and one season at a time. And this is a time of rebuilding after COVID and a lot of leadership transition. And we're entering into a period of rebuilding as a church. How many of you believe the Lord can carry us through a rebuilding season into a new season of mission in this region? Yeah, so I'm so glad to be with you. In this series, we're talking about fixer-uppers because relationships sometimes need some fixing up. And things happen in our relationships. And aside from salvation in Jesus, the gift of salvation, the most precious gifts the Lord gives us are relationships with the people that we care about. Those are his most precious gifts. And because they're so precious to us, when something is wrong in relationships, we feel it the most. We feel it deeply. And it's, it's very likely, as we are in this series and we go through a number of things, that there are going to be some things that feel very sensitive to you. And we talk about them, and it might even bring up things that are hurts that you haven't wanted to revisit and you would rather not think about. And I want to encourage you as we head into this series that the grace of God will help you and the presence of the Lord will minister to you. And we believe, one of the reasons we believe the Lord wanted us to do this series as we spent time in prayer together, the teaching team of Elam Gospel Church, and discerning what God is saying to different ones as we come together and prepare these things, is because not just so that we can talk about our needs, but so we can invite the Lord into our relationships and into our hearts where we've been hit by things because the Lord wants to grow us through them and he wants to do his healing work in us and he wants to bring restoration where there's, where there's room for that and as God begins to lead us. And so this week we're going to, uh, today we're going to talk about anger, pain, and unforgiveness. Whew, those are some big things. And the way, what we're going to do, the way it's going to go is I'm going to share a few things, just kind of introducing it this morning. And you might have noticed my wife Emily is up here too. And she's, after I share some things and just give some introduction, talk a little bit about anger, something I've found, found that is helpful. It's right out of Scripture, just kind of something from Scripture about anger. 
We're going to move into the forgiveness part, and Emily's going to share from her life something that she had to go through where God really helped her walk through some really difficult forgiveness, a path of forgiveness from experiencing some wrongs against her and what the Lord has taught her from that. I'm looking forward to that. And then I'll come back up a little bit to talk about forgiveness and how to walk in forgiveness. Just a few more points about that and some things in Scripture. And then we're going to have a response time. Just take a few moments in the Lord's presence to respond to His Word and to let the Lord minister to us where we might be wrestling and struggling in different relationships. So that sound good? Fixer Upper series. Relationships are so important. Here's a few things. Relationships sometimes bring hurt, and unless we are intentional in the way we respond, we are likely to get stuck in anger, pain, and unforgiveness. And how many of you know those things can be held in our hearts even when we don't show it on the outside? We can get stuck there. And the Lord doesn't want us to be stuck there. He wants to do a work in our lives and free us of those things. We deeply believe that as we grow in Jesus and His love, He will use us to bring healing into our relationships. You know, one of the most important truths about relationships is that I can't always work on and fix all the things that might be wrong in important relationships in my life. I can't always even fix myself and bring myself to a place where I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to do to help in the situation. And you find out pretty quickly that you can't fix and change other people. How many of you know that that's true? Can't fix and change other people. <laughs> but what I do know is that Jesus, in looking and setting my eyes on Jesus, and looking to Him and making Him my main pursuit, as I grow in Him and come to Him through my challenges in relationships, the Lord's work in my life strengthening me and he doing a healing work where I've been hurt, that will put me in a place where I am able then to invest back into relationships when that's appropriate and work for restoration and healing. And it really does, really does point to Jesus and His love and growing in Him that really is the number one key to health in our relationships. There's two parts to every story. But what I do know we can work on for sure is the part where we're coming to Jesus. A couple things in Scripture that point to this. Jesus said in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus said if you, if you, are, you stay connected to me, you're going to bear fruit in your life. You may not always see the outcomes that you're looking for, but out of your life will come the good fruit and the kinds of things that not only open you up to the Lord's work and healing in your life and strength, but will allow you to go back to others and be that person that they need who's going to show them love and forgiveness and even when it's difficult. And, and these fruits right here are so clearly spoken from the Apostle Paul in Galatians 5, to 23, and I bet you there's a number of you that have this memorized. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. The truth is that as I grow through my relationships, the Lord enables me to be like Him in my relationships. We don't just go through relationship challenges. Sometimes we just want to get through them, get past them. We don't just go through. God wants us to grow through. And relationships are challenging. Having love and joy and peace and forbearance or patience and all of these important fruit, fruits that the Lord wants to grow in our lives, having those in relationships is not something that happens by accident. It is something that requires intentionality. And I don't know if you're like me, but I found myself, I, I think we're probably very similar as human beings, but I found myself in situations when I'm in a problem in a relationship my attention tends to go to the other person and think that person needs to be fixed. 
and that will fix this relationship issue. Has anybody ever thought that before? My attention tends to go to the other person. Well, if, if they will just get fixed, and there are two sides in every story, and there are vital conversations that need to take place, and there is responsibility in both parts in relationships. But what we want to draw your attention to in this series and this morning is that the fixing we need to be about is letting God make us into those fixer-uppers as we invite Him into our hearts, into the way that we respond to people, in the way that we receive the words and the actions of others, even when they're not the words and actions that we're wanting to hear. And so God wants to use you as a fixer-upper. What's the first human response we often have when we have been hurt in a relationship oftentimes when things have not gone the way we wanted them to go in a relationship words or actions and maybe this is in the home um, maybe it's something at work or maybe in your family often anger is the natural human response anger is a very natural thing and it's not always a bad thing it's just a very very um, risky and very temperamental uh, and very uh, a, a very sensitive thing that we need to be careful and I want to give you before Emily begins to share I want to give you a few thoughts on handling anger well what we need to do is we need to be slow with anger and I put that in capitals not to yell at you but slow because it's in the scripture you know when when anger is handled incorrectly what almost always happens, and anger kinds, tends to be an impulse and a feeling that we just, we weren't looking for it. Uh, we, you know, we weren't trying to work it up. It's just something that comes to us as an impulse when we feel wronged. Anger, when it's handled incorrectly, almost always leads to words and actions that rather than helping the situation, they just add and multiply more hurts and wounds and division in the relationship. But when anger is handled correctly and handled well the way that we respond to angry feelings inside of us when it's handled well we can recognize areas of our lives and areas in our important relationships anger can be a sign that says you know there's something to work on here not just in my own heart but i'm i'm feeling and i'm noticing something that really bothers me and that needs to be talked about in a careful way needs to be addressed maybe it's a conversation definitely it's something for prayer and possibly even something where we need to look outside of just the relationship itself and look to someone professional who can help us in what we're going through and i know these are such difficult and challenging things but there is a correct way to handle anger you can't help the fact that sometimes we feel angry but we want to avoid the incorrect and a couple things here. James 1. This is the scripture I have for anger this morning. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen. This is where I got the word slow. Slow to speak and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Anger itself is not a sin. Anger itself is not the problem. It's how we respond to anger and what we do when we feel angry feelings in relationships. And I want to just run with that word slow for a few moments. And in case this would be helpful, this, this helps me. And it really does capture how I tend to look at what to do with anger. And people come to me sometimes and there's anger in relationships and anger uh, in a situation. And this is just a, a, a helpful way to put the counsel that I often give. S-L-O-W, number one is to stop. When you feel angry, stop. Resist speaking as a reaction. Resist responding hastily. Stop yourself from saying things that you feel to say in the emotions of the moment. Just see a red stop sign in your face there. Don't say those things right away. You know, don't, it, it might not be in, in, in an interpersonal conversation. Don't send that email so quickly, right? Don't respond with that text. Don't hit post yet. Just stop yourself. Nothing wrong with giving yourself some time and space, and that's really what I have found is so important to do. L stands for leave. Not for the long term. 
But take a breather. Leave that moment. I know somebody very precious to me, uh, a married couple, and they have a wonderful marriage, and they love the Lord. They have a beautiful family. They're just great people, and they, they love each other so much. And he's told me this, and he's talked to me at times about when he was having some very difficult conversations with his wife. And if you met the people, you would just think, oh, it don't seem like people that would ever get angry, but it's a human, we're human beings. And he said, sometimes we have conversations, and I realize in the middle of the conversation that what I need to do is I need to leave the house and go for a walk. And that's what he does. And he goes for a walk. His wife is extroverted. He's introverted. He needs time. He needs space to think about it, let his emotions and his feelings settle down. He said, when I come back from the walk, I just feel better about I feel more ready to respond to her in a healthier, in a more loving way. And you know, it might not be a walk for you. It might just be time. It might be some days. It might be, it might be a pause on, a relation, uh, uh, on the conversation itself. And you just leave that for a bit and look to a future time when you can reconnect okay really quickly here the O. Oh, this just helps me this is how i approach these things is to offer to reconvene at a good time that is good for you and good for the other person you know they might not be ready to settle it right then and there even if you feel usually when there are difficult conversations happening there's one person that wants to settle it right then and there and usually the other party needs a little space and you give a little space, don't let yourself respond too quickly, and be the one that takes the lead in a very gentle, gracious way to offer the opportunity. Hey, can we reconnect about this at a time when we both feel ready? Set that invitation out there. And then lastly, wait. That's hard to do for some of us, but be patient and allow them to... I think us lastborns in the family have to kind of kind of be chill because the, the, the firstborns are usually so intense, you know, the parents can't take it, right? Figured out, okay, what's the smart way to live in this family? Okay, I see the firstborn getting in trouble a lot, the middleborn's doing something a little different. Okay, what's what's my way to kind of make peace? And so that that's been my really that that is my personality. That's who I am. I don't get worked up really easily. Um, but something that is also a part of how God made me is that when I see injustice, when I see people being hurt, when I see things not done the way they should be, I become very stubborn and I become immovable. <laughs> and and if, if I am in a position where I am the one that needs to do something, I am not afraid. And um, I, was, I was in a situation like this once where I was leading and there was a, a leadership decision that just had to be made. There were some things happening that weren't proper and I knew it and I was the one to make that decision. And it was very difficult because the decision had an impact on someone who was very, very 
near and dear in my life. It was someone who had, I had a huge amount of respect for, and I knew it would be painful for that person, but I also knew under God I had to make the decision. I had to do the thing that God wanted me to do and, and that was correct to do. And what began to happen to me um, was that I saw a completely different side of this person, and it became very apparent that I was now under the scrutiny, that I was the one that, you know, for speaking up, that it, all laser eyes were on, you know, how, how, can I, how can I prove that this decision was the wrong decision? And it started to move in ways that I felt were unprofessional. Um, I would say it moved in directions where it even would be unethical. Um, there were things that started to happen that it was just such a shock to me. And, you know, it was during this time, this really a good chunk of time, where I just felt like I couldn't get a break. Like I would literally, like something would, it would be, it would, there would be peace, okay, the, the, everything is fine, and then something else would happen. And it wasn't anything I was creating. <laughs> I was just having to deal with this issue. And it was like I just couldn't, I couldn't catch my breath. And, you know, the, the things that were happening just felt very out of, out of control. And, you know, it was a really odd time in my life because though situationally there was a lot of, uh, you know, stressful conversations, a lot of, you know, difficult things, spiritually it, it really felt like revival time. I mean, I was just experiencing things with the Lord that I had never experienced. Um, his word was coming alive to me in a way that it hadn't in, in a long time. And it was just such an example to me of how God gives us the pathway. He gives us the pathway to walk through difficult situations with people. And I just want to share with you a few things that really rose to the surface that were really the strategies that, that I had, were, were given by the Lord, and then I employed in the situation that really moved it in the, in the right direction. You know, the one scripture that, oh yeah, I have to do this, don't I? Is it the left? Um, the, one, the one scripture that really just came to me in so many different ways uh, was James 4, 6. It says that God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And, you know, the thing that the Lord kept speaking to me throughout this entire ordeal was stay in a posture of humility because I resist the proud. And I just could almost like, like in my mind just see, like, you know, when you think of an a, a, a opposition, an opponent, you know, it's, there's, there's a separation. It's like, stop, you know? And it's not that God resists us as people, but he resists the, when pride is taking, taking a hold of us in some way. And, you know, it's so natural, especially when you're kind of coming under the microscope to want to defend yourself, to want to right the wrong, right? And, and I just really felt the Lord speak to me that, you know what, love is, has to be bigger than our sense of justice. Our love for people has to be wider than everything has to be correct, and, and there can be nothing wrong said about me, and I have to prove, you know, that this is wrong, but to keep this attitude of humility and that there is actually grace that comes when we do that. So that was the one scripture that just kept coming to me over and over again. And the second one, very similar, uh, Ephesians 4, 2, says, Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. And what I began to realize through this experience is that there's two ways to approach uh, relational offenses. We can take the position of a judge and when I think about a judge, I think about a courtroom, right? And a judge is a, a little bit higher than, than everyone else, right? Kind of the, 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 the platform's a little higher, looking down on, you know, the prosecutors, the defendants, the witnesses, the facts, the details, you know, collecting all of that, making a decision, and then boom, the gavel comes down, the decision is made. You know, sometimes with people, it's like we, we start to keep a scorecard, Okay, this is, they've done this, they've done this, oh, nope, they've done too many. This, this list is way too long, and, you know, boom, they're going to be out of my life. Boom, I'm, I'm leaving. Boom, I've made a decision. You know, it's clean, it's efficient, it's, it, 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 it feels right sometimes to, to do it that way. 
But there's another position that we can take. We can take the position of our Lord Jesus. You know, I think about in Philippians, it says that, that all, he came, everything was available to him. He was God. He was above all, and yet he came down to the earth as a servant. He came down to wash his disciples' feet. Like, I, I mean, I realize we don't do that in our day and age, but just to imagine, you know, the, 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 Jesus was washing his disciples' feet. And when I think about even that action of washing, you know, when, and we actually did this once at a family retreat. We, we washed each other's feet. And, you know, you're very close to people when you're washing their feet. I mean, it almost says you can smell their smells even, right? When they're, you're, you're near their feet. You, you can hear their breath. You can, you, you know, you're listening to them. They're, you're receiving. You're, 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 in, you're in connection with them. You're in relationship. And when we take that posture, what we often do is we hear what's behind the offense. And what I've discovered and what I discovered in this situation and what I've discovered in other situation, situations is that often it has nothing to do with me. It often has something to do with other people's hurts and insecurities, other people's, uh, you know, different heart, you know, relationships that are broken in their life. And I just happen to be the person that's getting it that's getting the, you know, because I'm touching on a nerve. I'm open. There's a wound that's there before I got there, and I'm kind of opening up that wound a little bit. So, but as I hear that, and as I observe that, I become more empathetic. I become more understanding. I become more willing to, you know, understand why that happened. And that is the posture of reconciliation. When we get in that type of when we're moving in that way, our heart is more open for reconciliation. So that was the first thing. The second thing um, was to really pray over the situation. There's a Christian leader, um, you know, he was, he was a martyr, is from many years ago, um, Christian leader named uh, Watchman Nee. I don't know if any of you have ever read a devotional uh, book by him. Brilliant man, has written a lot of wonderful, wonderful things. And he said this quote in one of his, one of his pieces of literature. He says, our prayers lay the track down on which God's power can come. You know, back in that day, trains were the mode of transportation and everything was, you know, tracks is something that people were very familiar with. Um, actually, I grew up in a, the, where I grew up, we were, we were a town that distributed a lot of strawberries. This was like back a couple generations. And so we had train tracks all over and around my town, and I always loved to kind of walk on them and, and think about them. But when, when we think about tracks, when we think about what they are, it, you know, they have to be created, right? Because these, these, uh, these locomotives, these, these, they can't come to us without these tracks. And these tracks had to be, you know, put in the ground. They had to be maintained. They had to be, you know, there was work to be done. And sometimes in conflict with people, there's work that we have to do in prayer. And not just a quick little, Lord bless them, Lord help me, you know, amen. You know, I'm talking about like intercessory, like, Lord, speak to them. Lord, speak to me. Lord, do a work. You know, it was that kind of prayer that God was calling me to. And that was the kind of prayer I did for this situation. And I really believe that that, that was a big key to the turning point. And, and I began to see God doing things that, that I, I, did not, I was not a part of. And it's such a big, you know, obviously I can't share every detail of the story, but there was just so many miracles and so many things that, that took place at that time. And then the last thing that is very important that we can often overlook is Ephesians 4.15. Oops, I've not been doing this. Sorry.
creation. You know, when I think about just even this light shining on me right now, you know, that light is probably showing all my imperfections, <laughs> probably showing, I don't even know what it's showing, maybe I don't want to know what it's showing, but, but the fact of the matter is when we're hiding a fence, there's, there's blockage. Not the, those people that are, are doing those things to us aren't even oftentimes able to see it. It's like a blind spot. And, you know, as we open up and as we share, you know, we're, we're actually helping them. We're loving them. We're, we're giving them information that could really save them from, you know, really hurting relationships in their life, you know, really hurting themselves personally. It's like we, we, move, we, we move more into authenticity and more into an authentic, loving community when we share and when we talk to people, honest things, difficult things. You know, because when we don't, we have the risk of becoming like a, you know, at best, a very superficial country club, right? That we just want to be nice, we want to smile, we want to be happy, right? And at worst, so that's, that's the best case scenario. The worst case scenario is that Satan's deception continues in people's lives and that they never see things and that the cyclical pattern of things just continue and continue and continue. So it's really in our love, it's in our being willing to put ourselves out there, being and the frustration. I saw Emily just dive into the Lord in prayer 
in his word and I saw her just growing in God and I saw her love in the situation and her love for the person just blossoming and getting bigger and bigger and I was just so amazed and so thankful and I'm so glad I never inserted myself but the time came when there was a coming together and a reconvening and it was much later there was a reconvening and some very critical and sensitive conversations took place together we were all in it together, but that was, that was later on when a lot of amazing things had taken place and we saw God building in everyone in the situation. But you know, we're aware that uh, it doesn't always turn out with a wonderful healing in the relationship itself. And boy, we wouldn't want you to think that one of the goals of this series is that we're going to give you some quick fixes for your relationships because relationships aren't like that. And we're not expecting quick fixes, but we know that God is able and He can move. And no matter what happens in the relationship itself, one of the, one of the biggest things about this series is no matter what c comes, you're going to be able as you grow in the Lord and, and just invest into prayer, you're going to receive from God strength and help and love to be able to get back into that situation. But no matter what happens in the relationship itself, we know and we believe the Lord wants to do a work in our hearts so that we're being healed up and we're brought into a place of being able to approach people with love and to approach people with forgiveness. And I just have a couple of things about forgiveness here as, as we're finishing up. When you think about your own heart and situations, I want to tell you ways I've learned that I still need to forgive someone. You know, you work on forgiveness sometimes. Some of you are seasoned forgiveness laborers for lack of a better term walking through some really difficult challenges and I've walked through some difficult ones in my own life and then later on find out the work wasn't done yet these are some of the signs I've learned that I still need to work on forgiveness when there's residual resentment or bitterness or hatred hatred is kind of obvious but sometimes it's just like a residue you just uh, you know you have that feeling about a person I, that's a sign Twinges of anger and dislike. You know, you may go a long time without really uh, being bothered by what took place or by the person. And sometimes there's just a twinge that kind of hits you. And I've learned to recognize that those twinges are signs to me that I'm not done with a spiritual journey of forgiveness for that person. And a couple more. Feeling like I can't handle seeing the person. I'm just being real human on the human level here with you. You know, if, if, there's, if you find that you can't even handle seeing them, that's, that's a sign to me that there is some work in your heart with you and Jesus to go down the path of forgiveness. And wanting them to fail. You know, none of us would want to admit that we would ever want someone to fail, but when you really when you're really harboring, uh, you're holding someone in debt to you, and they're, you're holding them as a debtor because of how they have wronged you, that feeling, and none of us would say, oh yeah, well, I want to have feelings towards people that I would like them to fail, but you're wanting them to fail in something uh, in life or in their relationships, and it's kind of an emotional way of wanting to get payback is thinking that you will celebrate their failures. What a horrible bottom that place is to feel that way about people to me i've learned that is a clear sign even if that feeling just kind of comes like a little you know a little spark of meanness i need to work on forgiveness and take it to the lord i want to give you a few misconceptions about i just want to give you some practical things to help you because th this is tough stuff some misconceptions why we might not want to deal with unforgiveness these are, these are mistakes to think this way. I can't forgive until the hurt or anger is gone. That's not true. Forgiveness is a decision. It is not a feeling. Later on, feelings begin to follow. And our love for the person begins to cover over some of the feelings. And God's work of healing in us takes place. But often we still feel hurt and anger when we need to be about the work of forgiveness. And so it's not something that is dependent on our feelings. It's a decision we make to go with God there. 
The hurt or wrongdoing is just too big to forgive. That is definitely not true, but sometimes our feelings tell us what they did is just too big for me. What I'm feeling is just too big. I don't think I will ever be able to forgive, and I want to tell you that that is not true. Even the biggest things, and sometimes things are very big, and they even affect and change our lives. Some of the wrongs that can happen. Another one I've heard and seen people struggle with is this feeling or assumption that if I forgive, I'm excusing the offense. No. Forgiveness is something we are to do in our hearts. It is an act of love. It is a part of our, our um, coming to God and then approaching or beholding that person and releasing them for what they have done. But we're not excusing the offense. We're not saying it was okay. We're not wiping it out and saying, you know, what you really did was really not a big deal or what took place, it really doesn't matter. No, it's not saying any of those things. Forgiveness is something separate. And I think this is one of this next one, this last one I have here, is one I think that has really tripped up a lot of people. And they struggle with forgiveness because of equating forgiveness with trusting someone. Did you know that you can forgive and we should forgive, and yet sometimes there is need to keep healthy boundaries and put new boundaries in places in certain relationships and have boundaries and maybe even separation in different ways. We're not saying that forgiving means I'm now going to trust and just be totally open to this person again. No, forgiveness is something that can happen even when we are not investing trust. Trust is something that people earn in relationships. We offer trust. Trust is like an investment in relationships. It's part of our investing in life. It's a risk. We invest trust, and it needs to be earned to remain. And sometimes people do things to lose our trust and there's need to have healthy boundaries, but we can still forgive even when we are keeping boundaries. A couple things in Scripture about what forgiveness is. This is how I summarize forgiveness as we finish up. Forgiveness is the end goal of a process involving a willful decision to prayerfully pardon a person for an offense. That's how I see it. It's a process, and it's the end goal. And God will get you there. He will take that weight off your heart. You set that goal. I want to give you hope this morning that God will get you there and He will allow you to release people from their offenses even when they haven't come to you and asked for forgiveness. And they may have no interest in righting the wrongs. God will get you there if you go to Him with those things. You know, forgiveness is also a command of Scripture. And if I were to just leave it at that or we were to finish with that, it would sort of be like, well, forgiveness is a have to. But it is a command of Scripture. Just one Scripture where we see this. Jesus said, And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. There's a number of Scriptures along these lines. It's actually a command of Scripture, but you know, it's not just a have to. Forgiveness is a healing journey, and part of the healing we need in our lives from the things that take place in relationships is waiting on our going to God so that we can forgive others. Forgiveness is also possible. It is possible because of the love and grace of God as He works in you. And as the Lord works in you, what might seem to you today as an impossibility to release someone, I want to say to you this morning, it is possible because God's a big God. And think of how completely He has forgiven you and me. How totally, uh, uh, totally erased our sins are because of the cross of Jesus. And as we walk with the Lord and we let Him work His love into our hearts, He will form that love in us in our relationships and give us the ability to release people and to forgive them. Ephesians 4, 31-32 says, get Paul's instructions, but then he points to Jesus. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ in Christ, God forgave you. Would you stand with me this morning? It seems really fitting and very important that we take a few moments just to respond on, on such a big thing. And 
I want you just to ask yourself here in the presence of the Lord. Maybe, Lauren, you could come up for a few moments and play. Who do I need to forgive? Is there somebody? Why don't you just ask, prayerfully ask yourself that question. Who do I need to forgive? Where is there work to do in this area? And you know, if there's something rising in your heart and mind, there's someone or some situations or words I want to point all of us to those relationships. And on the other side of forgiveness, there is a freer heart. There's a greater love. And there's a personal inner healing often that waits. And there is the freedom to then love people back even when they haven't righted their wrongs. And this morning, I would like us to just take these moments in the presence of the Lord. Just lift up those people, the situation, and I would expect for some of you here today, that's a difficult thing to do, even just to take time to meditate on this while you're at church. But in this place where the Lord is in our midst and we're together, I believe the Lord's grace and strength and anointing is available for you this morning to work His love deeper into your heart and enable you to behold people more like He does in His love. And so let's just take a moment. Let's lift up those people and lift up our own hearts to the Lord. Lord, you are aware of the hurts that we have experienced. You know the pain and the struggles and the anger and the challenges of forgiveness and unforgiveness that we have faced. And sometimes, Lord, we are surprised to find that these things are lurking in our hearts and feelings of malice or just harboring hurts or holding people in debt to us. Lord, you are a God that knows the deepest places of our hearts. And Lord, we invite you in today. We invite you into those places, Lord, where we've been hurt. You are a healing God. And you move in such a way that you begin to sew up those places where we are wounded. And you cover over them with your love, Lord. And you, sometimes it's over time, but sometimes in a moment, you take away hurts that we have been carrying. And so God, we open up those places to you today. And Lord, we lift up people in our lives. If there is something going on, Lord, there's people who have, where there is tensions and there's been hurt, there's been pain, and there's a need for forgiveness. Lord, we lift up those people before you. We know that you love them with an everlasting love. And God, would you help us to look at them, to behold them more like you do. Lord, we're not excusing what has taken place. We don't know how that's going to work out. We don't know what the end of the whole story will be, but we do know that you have an everlasting love. And so God, we invite you to minister your love in our hearts for those people. The love of Jesus Christ, that same love that embraced us and forgave us of our sins. And we give you permission today, Lord. Father, I pray for your people that you would strengthen them. Would you help us, Lord, to walk in love, to release people, to not be afraid of hurts, to not be afraid of relationships where there's things going on. But Lord, would you strengthen us today? I pray that you would strengthen your people with your grace and your power. And we pray it in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.